All right, it's Friday. Nice, spring is here. We have essentially two weeks left starting next week. Um, we have a lot that we're still gonna talk about this semester. We're gonna talk about hashing. We're gonna talk about one of the other data structures you meet in heaven, something called a map. Uh, we're gonna talk about errors and exceptions in Java, which is something you should know as a Java programmer. But for the next couple lectures, I want to talk about something else. Um, and this is something that is related to your life in technology and your understanding of the world around you. So we've been teaching you how to program, we've been teaching you some of the basic principles and practices uh, that underlie computer science as a field. But today I wanna talk a little bit, for the next you know, one, two, maybe two and a half lectures, I wanna talk a little bit about one of the most tech important technological artifacts um, that we've created as, as a community, something that you guys are used to, you were born into, uh, but something that is still relatively new and something that the impacts of which we're still feeling and are, are going to sort of uh, really transform the world around you uh, going forward. And that is the internet uh, and the World Wide Web. So today we're gonna introduce you to a little bit of the infrastructure uh, behind this so you get a sense of you know, what the internet is on a variety of different levels. We'll also talk about some of the basic protocols that underlie how the internet works. And eventually we're gonna talk a little bit about how the web works. This is something that you guys use all the time. And yet this is something that is still extremely modern. You know, when, when, I, got to, uh, when I got to college, we were still checking email by logging into a, uh, to a central server and running this command line application. Um, you know, webmail was something that, that still, you know, was sort of a, a thing that was coming down the road. And so the amount of change that's gone on um, over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years is pretty remarkable. And so one of the things I want to try to do today, to the degree that I'm capable of this, is take something that you're familiar with, take something you're used to, take something that, you know, again, is something that you're immersed in, that you don't really think about very much, and try to make it seem strange and unusual and incredible and interesting, right? And that is sort of the internet and, and the World Wide Web. So what I really want to talk about and what will be really useful for you on your final project is the, uh, this idea of web APIs. So, you know, using the internet and the World Wide Web and, and some of the protocols that underlie them to contact and access external sources of data and external services that you can use and integrate into your own app. This is something that's gonna be required for the final project that you guys start working on next week and that we will enjoy looking at in our final project fair, which is, uh, I think, three weeks from yesterday. But, and you guys, again, have already sort of done this. You guys worked on this on MP3, you know, I mean, people on Reddit thought we were crazy because we had you guys use a web API, and oh, JSON, oh, it's so scary. It's not scary, it's pretty easy stuff. I think you guys figured that out by the time we were done. Um, but this is something that, again, we're gonna have you double down on, and the reason for this is that it's one of the most exciting ways to build uh, fun, interesting applications. But before we can talk about web APIs, we need to kind of talk about the web, and before we can talk about the web, we have to talk about the internet itself. Um, and this is a topic that, that I enjoy quite a bit. I actually, uh, before I got here, I taught an entire uh, course on um, this topic. I think that if you study the internet and you learn about how it works and how it came about, this is a really beautiful story. It involves technology, it involves consensus and agreement, it involves um, you know, people working together over long distances, it involves a lot of infrastructure, which I think is really cool and interesting. Um, and so this is a big story. It's much bigger than just tech. This is about society, it's about culture, it's about civilization. This is something that, you know, the internet is, in my opinion, this um, embodiment of a fundamental human desire that we've had ever since our species sort of started to recognize ourselves, which is this desire to communicate with each other. When Facebook talks about connecting the world, that's a little bit of marketing um, spin, but the fact is we want, you know, humans want to communicate. That's one of the things that defines our species. Um, and so I taught this whole class on this. You can find, a, there's a bunch of videos online. Oh, this is, this is really cool. I wish I, I wish I had a piece of this. We're gonna talk about this later. Um, but I, I've, I've done you know, a fair amount of work thinking about this topic um, and I enjoy talking about it. So hopefully uh, you'll enjoy listening uh, and thinking about some of this. Okay, so let's start to unpack this question of what is the internet? This is something that you know, I think a lot of you, I suspect, don't know how to answer. 
And it's a question you should know how to answer as a technologist, as a computer scientist, because this is something that is a part of your life and is also reshaping our society and our civilization in ways that are both good and not so good. All right? So what is the Internet? So let's start here. The Internet is infrastructure. So when we think about what the Internet is on a physical level, there is a, a physicality to the Internet. The Internet is a variety of different things, but it starts with uh, stuff. It starts with wires. Um, you know, there, there was a famous Internet uh, meme. I don't know how many of you guys remember this. You know, um, the, the, there was a senator from Alaska who was talking about the Internet. It's a series of tubes. Um, how many people remember this? Is this still percolating around? Yeah, the Internet is a series of tubes. It's not. Correct, but it's not actually that wrong, right? So what am I showing you here? This is a graph. It's obviously a graph of the United States. Um, what is um, overlaid on this graph are major backbone internet links. So what does that mean? So this means that, let's see, here we are, uh, somewhere over here. That, that means that somewhere sort of crossing Missouri, buried underground, there is an incredibly high-speed, high-capacity cable, a wire. We'll talk about what that wire is in a minute. It probably will surprise you what it's composed of. Um, but a wire that is carrying Internet traffic, you know, from, you know, uh, here over to this direction. I don't know, this, is this St. Louis? I'm not good with, with uh, geography in this part of the country, right? Down here in Texas, same thing, right? We have a wire. We have a cable buried underground. Um, that is carrying uh, data traffic, you know, west and east across Texas. Now, now, clearly, if you look at this graph, you may think, wait, you know, like, I don't see the cable that connects my house. Like, how can this be correct? These are backbone links. You know, when, when Al Gore talked about the Internet as the information superhighway, this is the superhighway part of the Internet. The road infrastructure is, not a, an, is another sort of not bad metaphor, right? The Internet consists of a lot of little streets and alleys that actually connect you to the broader Internet. But when you're trying to move data across the country, you're going to start off at your house and you're going to you know, start off on a little, uh, a smaller road. But eventually you're going to get on one of these superhighways. Right? These, are, these are large, um, extremely fast, extremely high capacity, uh, high bandwidth links that move data extremely quickly over long distances. So if you imagine, if you send, if you're on Facebook, and if you're actually on one of Facebook's servers in California, which is unlikely, because Facebook probably has a data center around here where they have some servers that you would connect to, you know, your packet's going to start off here, and pretty soon it's going to be following one of these major uh, backbone links, right? It makes a couple of small hops, but eventually ends up on one of these um, really high-speed links, right? So here's the other thing that's really interesting and, and, and cool about this, is that this infrastructure, is a mirror image. So you might wonder, like, why are there certain routes on here, right? Why does the cable follow a particular uh, path, right? And what's, what's, if you, you, can, you can take this map and you can overlay it on a couple of other maps that describe similar systems. So who can guess what one of those is? We're just using it as a metaphor. Yeah, over here. Yeah, so there's telephone lines that run along this as well. That's one, yeah. Uh, power grid is, is a little more distributed than this, right? Who, uh, here's another way to think about it. Who chose these routes? These routes are old, way in the back. Highway maps, yeah, interstate highways. So a lot of these routes follow major interstate highways. Now, at some level, that makes sense, right? If there's a problem with the cable, you don't want it running through the middle of nowhere. You want it close to a place where you can get to it, okay? Now, here's another question for you. Where did the interstate highway routes come from? Right? So they're following an even older set of routes that somebody cooked up years and years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Eisenhower gets credit for this, but, but who chose these routes? Yes. Yeah. Railroads. Yeah, so this goes back to, like, you know, the turn of the century. At some point, someone made these plans about how to, you know, at, at a certain point in time, this is, you know, maybe hard for you guys to remember, um, we, we couldn't, there was no way to connect with the West Coast, right? If you wanted to get out West, you got in a wagon, you know? 
um, and hoped you didn't die of a, you know, diphtheria or whatever somewhere in, in uh, Missouri, right? Um, so the, the first, our first attempts at connecting things over long distances, particularly uh, moving physical things around, were the railroad system, right? And then we upgraded to vehicles and we rebuilt another level of infrastructure, another layer of infrastructure over those same routes. And now, even when we move data, we are using those same old routes, okay? All right, so here's how things move around. These are the, again, this is the backbone internet backbone in the United States, right? This is not every link. If I showed you every link, the map would just be black. These are the incredibly high bandwidth, high capacity links that your data gets on as fast as it can. So when you send data across the country, as quickly as possible, you wanna get on one of these links um, so that your data can move long distances rapidly. Okay. Even cooler, how do we move data around the world, right? I have a question for you. How many people thought this was done wirelessly? Like, how many people would have guessed that if you transmit data to England, it's like going over some wireless connection? Be honest. It's okay. Yeah, no way. Way too slow. How do we do it? How do we do it? Yeah. Underwater cables. Yeah. Uh, so this is a map showing under, underwater cables. Every one of the links on this map is a cable that has been dropped, that is, you know, lying on the ocean floor. So literally, you know, you start a boat in Boston with a cable attached to it. This is how, it's, this is how it works. And it sails over to London with a, there's like a big spool of cable and you're like unrolling that thing as you go. Uh, and when you get there, you hope that, you know, you didn't kink it anywhere along the way. Um, and, and this is how this is done. We're still laying these cables. Right? But we've been doing this now for decades and decades. But the, the majority of the way that internet traffic moves around the world, particularly long distances over high-speed links, is on a wire. And so when we wanted to connect you know, the east coast of the United States to Europe, you see all of these underwater links. This map, I don't think, actually shows the exact route. I'm not even sure we know what the exact routes are. Right? Some of this is proprietary information. But you can see you know, how, how these cables have been laid. Okay? Now, going back again to this idea of this infrastructure mirroring old infrastructure, uh, why do these cables follow these routes? Right, so think about it. Like, you're hiring a company to, um, to lay an underwater cable. And you're saying, okay, well, I want, I want that cable to go from the west coast of the United States over to, to Asia, maybe to Japan or to China. How are they going to get there? Yeah. The same old shipping routes they've been using for centuries. Yeah, so these cables follow old shipping routes, right? So the old routes that we used to move stuff back and forth, that's the routes that the companies that lay these cables know how to sail. And so that's the routes that they use when they lay these. Right? So again, you can find all this stuff online. These are really actually pretty fun to look at. Um, uh, you can find out information in certain cases about these cables, who owns them, who operates them. Um, some of the companies that own these cables you've heard of, some of our big internet uh, providers like Google now are at the point where they have their own cables. So Google actually now owns undersea cables that they use to communicate between some of their data centers. Um, in a lot of cases, usually smaller internet companies will just send traffic along cables that have been laid by other providers. A lot of these uh, companies you've probably never heard of, the, the companies that maintain these cables, right? They're not like fancy, you know, um, normal tech companies you've heard of. But again, now Google and Facebook are moving enough traffic that it started to make sense to them, I guess, to lay their own underwater cables, okay? Here's what's in one of these, okay? And this is the other thing I think that's really fascinating about this story, right? Um, what is this? Or, or what is the core of these cables? This might surprise you. You know, what's, what's the core of these cables? Yeah glass. Yeah, so one of, one of the enabling technologies, again, this is like such a cool story. There's so many interesting bits and pieces of different things that were required to get all this to work. One of the enabling technologies for the internet is glass. How many, and probably may, very few of you knew that. So if you go to, there's a, there's a company in upstate New York called, not upstate New York, western New York actually, called Corning. If you go to Corning, so Corning for years made glassware like cups, you know, a cup that you would drink in. If you go to Corning now, 
uh, to their uh, factory, they have a very nice visitor center. Very nice. Um, too nice for a company that makes glasses, right? People use plastic now, right? The reason is Corning was one of the first companies that was able to make glass of a high enough quality to be used in fiber optic cables. And that's where most of their money is made, as far as I understand today, is making glass for fiber optic cables. This is not just, again, the same quality glass that you would use in a, in a cup. This is incredibly clear glass. It has to be made to an incredibly high standard. And there's only a couple companies in the world that actually make fiber optic cable. One of um, the concerns with trying to expand where fiber optic cables go, we'll talk about this in a second, is that there's not actually very many companies that can make glass at this quality that we can use to, to transmit these types of signals. So again, no fiber optics, no glass of this quality, we really wouldn't have the internet we know today. So hopefully what you've noticed by this point is that at a physical level, the internet is this massive investment by people all over the world in connecting things together, literally. So if you communicate with Facebook or if you go on Google, um, the first connection here in the room is wireless. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. But after that point, there is a wire. So we could do this, I actually did this at, at Buffalo. We could start with, let me see if I can find a router in here. There's some back there. There's a few back in the back. I don't wanna use my laser pointer because I don't wanna blind anybody. Um, but there, there are wireless routers in here. So we could start at that wireless router. Let's say you're going on the Guardian website in, in the United Kingdom. We could start at this router, and we could, we'd find in the back of the router a cable. And we could follow that cable. At some point, that cable's gonna uh, come into a, a ro locked room in this building somewhere, and we're gonna see it connected to another cable. And we could follow that cable. At some point, that cable's gonna connect to another cable, probably in the basement, which is gonna connect to another cable to some other room on campus, which is connected to another cable that probably runs up to Chicago, where it ends up in a building, a very, very nondescript building somewhere in downtown Chicago, where it connects up with a bunch of other cables. And we could keep doing this. And eventually, we're gonna get onto one of those long links that's gonna cross the country, and eventually we're gonna find ourselves on the east coast of the United States, and again, in a very nondescript building. And what we're gonna find is we're connecting now to a cable that runs underwater. And we could follow that cable all the way across the ocean, again, comes up somewhere in some nondescript part of the United Kingdom, and we can keep doing this. And eventually, if we keep doing this, we're gonna find ourselves in some data center somewhere in the United Kingdom, connected to a computer. You know, a computer that is serving the files that you are browsing as you look at some sort of uh, a British, British website. So all of this has to come together, right? All of this had to be built and created. And so there's an enormous amount of investment in this. Now again, one of the things I wanna disabuse you of is this idea that wireless plays a major role in the backbone of the internet. Typically, your first connection to the internet is wireless. So if I'm using my, my, my laptop, for example, right, it's connected to the router. That's a wireless connection. When you go outside, your phone is connected to a, um, a wireless access point placed by you know, Verizon or AT&T or whatever uh, service provider you use. But that's it. Past that point, most of the infrastructure is wired. The reason is mainly because wired infrastructure is much higher bandwidth and cheaper to deploy. So again, you guys have this uh, illusion that we've created, which is fantastic. I mean, wireless is awesome. But just that first hop is wireless. The rest of it is almost all wired. Second thing is most of it's glass, like I said. So if we started here, like I said, if we started here in this room, we pulled the wire out of the back of that router, um, what would that wire look like? How many people have ever plugged anything into a jack in their dorm room or you know, when you're setting up a router at home to help your parents or whatever? What, what kind of wire is that that you plug in there? Yeah. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's a cable called an ethernet cable, but like, if you cut it open, what, what's inside the wire? It's copper, yeah, copper cables. A lot of times that's what we use for our first connection to the internet, is a copper cable. So if I go over to this router, what I'm gonna find coming out of the back of it, if I cut that cable open, is copper. However, what's the problem with copper? Well, I think it says on the, on the slide. So there's two problems with copper. First of all, when I send a signal across a copper cable, it moves much more slowly than it does across glass. You can look this up online. So the speed of light through copper is much slower than it is through glass. 
And, this, and even through glass, it's a little bit slower than the speed of light through air or through a vacuum, okay? The other problem with copper is that signals attenuate quickly, so they get, they, they get weaker. That's one of the reasons why, if you go back and look at these, you know, let's go back and look at this map of cables crossing the country. Fr frequently, when we use fiber optic cables, we can send signals for hundreds of miles without, and, and the sender and receiver can communicate over that distance. If I had to use copper, I would have to run cables constantly. So typically, copper is only used for the first about 100 meters of a connection, or the last 100 meters. So that means if I start at this router and I start pulling that cable, it's gonna be copper for maybe 50, maybe 100 meters. Then I'm gonna find myself in a closet somewhere in this, in this building. And what it's gonna hook up to is a router, and what comes out of that router is glass. And it's glass all the way till I get to very, very, very close to wherever my destination is. So, so all of this is really based on fiber and this, this incredible uh, quality, high quality of glass that we've been able to create. These fiber optic cables are, are incredible, right? I mean, you, maybe you guys are yawning, you think that I'm going on about this. That's, that's fine, right? How many people have ever uh, examined a fiber optic cable? I wish I had one to show you guys. It's this tiny, tiny little really delicate thing. Um, and yet, actually, hold on a sec. Let me go back. Uh, this is the, okay. Sorry, there, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, there's a clip here where um, I'm talking to one of the network engineers. It's not here, no, no, this is me taking apart stuff in my office. Um, in a minute, one of the network engineers on campus is gonna show you guys one of these cables and a, um, and a little bit of a, of a testing infrastructure. Yeah, okay, so now we're in a server room. Sorry, I started exactly the wrong spot. All right, we'll get there. Don't I look excited? I know, I am excited. Trapped in a server room with a microphone. All right, here we go. So he's got, so see this right here? That's it. You can see it right in the bottom of the slide. He's using a, a, a piece of network testing infrastructure to test that cable to see if there's any kinks in it. That's why it's glowing so brightly. Normally they don't look like that. Um, but that cable, so, so we did this. Again, we, um, you know, he helped me this is, there's always one person on campus who knows where all the stuff is and is the expert on, on it, and, and that was the person there. Um, we together went through all of the closets, and eventually uh, we found ourselves in a closet looking at a cable that was carrying all of the traffic for the entire campus. And I, believe, and, and I, I will guarantee there's some room here at the University of Illinois that has a similar function, where all of the traffic from all the dorms, all the classrooms, all the, you know, the academic buildings all comes together and leaves campus. And it leaves campus on a wire just like the one that you looked at. Tiny, slender, right? You, you look at it and you're like, how could this possibly carry all this traffic? But those fiber optic cables are incredibly high bandwidth. They're, they're, they really are kind of a marvel of modern technology. So again, without this glass, we don't have an internet. Um, you know, without this, these innovations in fiber optics, we really just don't have the internet that we would have today. It would, be, it would really almost be impossible to lay these, particularly these undersea cables, right? You know, laying an undersea cable made out of, of uh, copper would be extremely, extremely hard. People managed to do that back in the day. Um, but the fact that we can use fiber for this is fiber optics and clear glass is really important. All right. So again, if you want to look at this, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, show you, but we actually do, I did do have a series of videos you can watch where we essentially uh, find our way all the way out of campus. This was done at, at the University of Buffalo, not here. Um, but you can see, you know, the cable coming out of the wall in my office, right? That's, um, that's uh, copper. We follow that kind of through. In Siebel, you can see some of this running across the ceilings. You can see these cables. We follow that to the room where it connects to a fiber cable. We follow that downstairs and then across campus. And we eventually find ourselves at the place where all the traffic leaves campus. So that was kind of fun. All right, so let's talk a little bit about wireless now, right? So most of this is wired once you get to the interesting parts, but wireless is the thing that really defines uh, your experience of the internet. And, and this is where wireless starts, right? So if you look around this room, if you look around campus, um, you may notice these wireless routers all over the place. Um, and a lot of the wireless that, that you guys connect to now is, is Wi-Fi, right? Wi-Fi is a common way to provide short range 
wireless signals, okay? However, when we travel around, when we leave, you know, the confines of this room, we go outside, it's a beautiful day, it's gonna be a nice weekend, you guys are gonna be out, you're still connected to the internet. And part of the reason for that is we've also been building out this enormous, expensive, extremely um, uh, interesting uh, sort of medium range wireless infrastructure. So when you leave this, uh, when you leave Lincoln Hall, you're no longer connected to the campus Wi-Fi, but most of you are still connected to the internet and you're connected through uh, a cellular link, right? How many people have noticed these around before? Know what they are? What, 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 is, what, what do you think this is? Yeah. This is a cellular tower, in fact, indeed. Why does it have that shape? Anybody know? You see this everywhere, right? Unless you're like in downtown Chicago and it's constrained or something. Sometimes you see these on the sides of buildings if you go into a, a, a city or whatever. So this is in fact a cell tower. Uh, these are cellular antennas, right? So you can see I've got one pointed this direction, I've got one on the side here, and then I've got one in the back that you can kind of see that's pointed that direction. And then I actually have a, a second um, level of these on the top of the tower. I suspect these are probably two different carriers that are sharing this tower. You see that happen a lot, right? Maybe this is Verizon, this is AT&T or something like that, right? We have a lot of overlapping infrastructure in this country. Um, but why is it that shape? Again, you, particularly in open space, you see them a lot in this shape. It's an equilateral triangle. Does anyone know why? Geometry buffs here? Yeah. Well, so the, I, the idea behind when, when I place these out in the world, I want to place as few as possible while still being able to, yeah, I, I don't want you to, I, I want you to be, everyone to be kind of equidistant from one of these, right? Um, but why, are the, why is the shape, in, it could be a square, it could be a circle, right? It could be an octagon or something. Why is it always a triangle? Yeah. Good guess, but that's not, that's not correct, yeah. Nope. Another good, good guess, but no, yeah. Well, you, guys are, you guys are sort of sniffing around the right answer, right? Um, the right answer is, I, I wish I had a picture of this. Um, if you wanna fill space, an efficient way to fill space is to fill it with hexagons. The nice thing about a hexagon is if I put one of these at every corner, the people, the, your, your clients, your customers that are moving around within that hexagon are evenly distributed between the corners. Now, if you fill space with hexagons, and again, I should have had a picture of this on the slide, what you find is that every place where a hexagon comes together creates an equilateral triangle. So this tower is positioned at the intersection of three cells. When possible, cellular companies like to create cells that are hexagonal in shape. Every tower is placed at the intersection of three cells. So I have one antenna here that's serving one cell. I have a second antenna here that's serving a, th a second cell. And I have a third antenna here that's serving a third cell. And every place where three cells come together, I have a tower like this. Up here you can see I have a similar uh, triangular shaped uh, setup, but this company is using like a different layout. It's not oriented exactly the same, right? So AT&T and Verizon don't exactly agree on where the hexagons are, right? Or, or how they're pointed, right? But this is why you see cells, uh, cell towers with this uh, arrangement. Once you start noticing these, you're gonna see them all over the place, right? I mean, this is one of the major ways that we've invested in infrastructure in this country, particularly wireless infrastructure, right? This is also what you hear about when you hear about things like 5G. How many people have been hearing about 5G? You know, this is really exciting. Well, to some degree, right? I don't want to undersell 5G, uh, but on some degree what 5G is is just more network infrastructure, right? It's, you know, a different set of technologies, different set of, uh, you know, different ranges of signal that we're using and stuff like that, but a lot of it's just more infrastructure, right? That's why it takes, you know, that's why it takes a while to roll out these new technologies is that, you know, these companies have to go around and, and build new stuff or at least go to existing towers and add new infrastructure. So, so again, so we, we, we have, 
the, the physical wired infrastructure of the internet is largely in place, although there's still places where we're working on that. But the investments over the past couple decades have been largely in wireless infrastructure. So short range wireless, you know, this is what you find at the coffee shop, at the airport, at the hotel, on campus, in your dorm, at your parents' house. I have no idea how many wireless routers there are in this country, but I would suspect that the number is probably in the, you know, maybe approaching a billion, right? I mean, they're everywhere, right? We've blanketed, at least all the places where we live and we work and we hang out, we've blanketed with Wi-Fi, right? If you go to Chicago or to a dense urban area and you look on your phone, a lot of times you can see signals from like 100 different Wi-Fi access points at any given point in space. Keep in mind those signals only travel maybe 100 meters. So, you know, if you're standing on some busy downtown corner and you're picking up signals from 50 different routers, that means within 100 meters of you, there are 50 different Wi-Fi routers. They're all competing for bandwidth and serving different customers. And then this medium range Wi-Fi as well, right? So this is what you get when you're driving around, when you're out of the range of a Wi-Fi signal. You get wireless infrastructure that's provided by a company like Verizon or whatever. Um, and you usually purchase this from one of those cellular companies. Okay, so, oh, and, and so this is, this is kind of a, well, so let's look at where the internet has spread. So this is a graph, I think this is maybe a year or two old now, um, but this is showing internet activity um, over time. As, so this is at night, right? Now people wake up and you see hotspots start to form, right? And then kind of toward the end of the day, everybody's watching Netflix and then people go to bed, right? Um, What's interesting to you about this graph? If you look at this. What, what, what can you, what are some of the takeaways from this? Someone who hasn't contributed yesterday. Yeah. Okay, so that's an interesting observation. So, so the observation is people don't, the, the people are not evenly distributed in the world, right? Um, so, you know, there are hotspots here where you can see where a lot of people live. So, for example, in Australia. Has anyone ever been to Australia? Like, nobody lives here. It's okay that this part of Australia is dark. There's, like, no one there, right? It's not that those people don't have internet access. It's that there's no people to access the internet there. Like, almost the entire population of Australia lives on the eastern coast. And that's good, there's a good reason for that, because it's nice there. Um, but, okay, so to some degree this tracks population, except what? Maybe some of you have heard about something that's going on in the news last couple days. Maybe some of you might have voted. I don't know if you're allowed to do that. This also, but th this isn't quite right, right? Where, so on some level this is like a re representation of people, where people live, right? But it's not quite, quite accurate. Where are we missing? Where are we missing things here? Somebody point out a spot on the map where they feel like we should probably see more activity. Yeah. Africa? Yeah. A lot of people live in Africa. Not a lot of internet traffic. Africa is one of the uh, most underserved areas as, as far as internet infrastructure. What about India? There's a fair amount of activity in India, but India is like, you know, a seventh of the world's population or something like that, right? That should be bigger. China as well, right? If you compare Europe with, you know, the Indian subcontinent, what you're seeing here is not population. There are way more people living in India than there are, I think, in the entire, um, in this is part of Europe that you see lit up. The problem is that we are still working to bring the internet to everybody on Earth. Estimate, how many people have internet access today on the planet? It's about seven billion people on Earth. What percentage of them have regular access to the internet? Obviously, this might be once a day, you know, maybe once every couple of days. Certainly, we're not talking about people that are constantly connected like all of us. Anyone know what the number is? Estimate? Yeah. It's a little higher than that. Yeah. A little higher. Two billion is not too far off. Yeah. About 50%. Yeah, about, yeah, I think it's about three billion now. It really depends on how you count it, right? So we've got seven billion people on Earth. We have this incredible system we built to connect them all together. Only three billion of them are online. And that's actually one of the reasons why I like talking about this with you, because your generation, 
is going to live through, I think, a substantial expansion of this system we've built to the rest of the world. And I would argue that the parts of the world that are not online yet are the more interesting parts to bring online. The kind of transformations that the internet is going to bring to the types of areas that we haven't connected yet are, are really substantial. And you will all have an opportunity to participate in that in the future. You know, if you think about the types of things we do online today and the kind of things that the people who aren't connected yet are going to want to do online and are going to need to do online and the kind of ways that the internet's going to change their lives, there's a big difference there. There's a big difference between the needs of like a tech bro in San Francisco, right, and what someone in Africa needs from the internet, right? So we have a lot of really interesting problems to solve in the future. So, but we're, we've also done a lot, right? So this is pretty astounding. When you bring, when you connect to the internet, you are now connected to about four billion other computers. Again, not people, computers. Four billion other devices. You bring your device, you bring your computer online, you now have the opportunity to communicate with this incredible number of, this, this, again, this is the type of thing, we've never done anything like this before, ever, in, in human history. Um, you know, a lot of times your first uh, connection is wireless, mostly by that point uh, it's on a wire. But these, this is the scale. You know, you guys connect to the Wi-Fi here in this room, there are now four billion other devices out there that you can potentially exchange and remain information with. Okay, so, we talked about the wires and the signals. This stuff is, you know, the, the wireless stuff, if you're curious about, I would encourage you to look up more because you could, we could teach an entire class about wireless connectivity and how it works. It's fascinating. But let's not talk about that anymore. Let's talk about what we talk about when we talk online. So now I have this ability to exchange signals. I can send data from one computer to another computer. And that's incredible. But what do I talk about and how do we structure these communications? So the next thing that the internet is, you start off with the internet is physical infrastructure. It's the wires, it's the routers, it's the cables. But on top of that, the internet is also something else. The internet, and this is really the thing I think that is the most indicative of what the internet is. The internet is an agreement by everybody who's connected to the system about how we are going to communicate with each other. That agreement is sometimes known as a protocol. So a protocol is a word that goes back to the days of, um, you know, and, and still applies to the days of interaction between nations, right? When the ambassador of, you know, a country comes to visit the White House, there's a protocol about how that person is received. A protocol in a computer system is a set of rules about how two computers interact, how they communicate in this case. So a communication protocol is a, a, a series of rules that allow communication to take place. So if the internet was just a bunch of computers just like trying to send stuff to each other willy-nilly, nothing would work. But instead of what we've done is we've structured this through um, a protocol. That protocol is known as the internet protocol, IP. This is where IP address comes from. How many people have heard the term IP address before, right? That's the address you get when you connect to the internet. It's an internet protocol address. And again, this is really the capital I internet, the internet protocol. This is a real thing, you can look it up. You know, this is not like, you know, just, just a hand wavy thing. This is a very specific agreement about how devices communicate. And there's a couple of questions that we have to answer in order for this to work. The first thing we have to decide once we start connecting all these computers together is what are we going to call each other? How am I going to address another machine? Again, the idea of an address. If I want to talk to your computer, I'm going to try to send in a message, but I need to be able to send the message to your computer, and that means I need to know what to call, right? So this is IP addressing. These are the two main things that IP does. One is it sets up a structure for how computers on the internet address each other. Here's an IP address. How many people have seen something like this before? Yeah, this is an IP address. You see it typically in this dotted decimal notation. There are 32 bits of information here, 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, and 8 bits. 
Now, this is an address in a format that's known as IP version 4. That's the original version of the IP protocol that goes back to, you know, the earliest days of the internet. What's the problem with this? Anybody know? If I have 32 bits, how many different addresses can I represent? 32 bits in Java is the size of an int. The Java int has 32 bits. So how many different computers can have an address on the internet in this format? Some of those numbers you should know as a computer scientist, yeah. Four billion, yeah. Rule of thumb, two to the tenth is a thousand, two to the twentieth is a million, two to the thirtieth is a billion. So I've got 32 bits, that's two to the thirtieth, a billion, two extra bits, two to the, two to the squared is four. It's four billion, four billion addresses. Now it turns out that this, that, that, I won't bore you with the details, but a lot of these are unusable, so the number of usable IP addresses is actually smaller than that. Remember, I just said there are four billion devices online. There are seven billion people on Earth. This is probably about the only mistake that the early internet designers made. They didn't make the address space large enough. If you talk to, uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute, of some of the early uh, internet architects, they'll admit, they were like, yep, we messed up. You know, we thought, oh, I mean, maybe one day there'll be thousands of machines connected to the internet, right? They never dreamed of a world in which every person on Earth is connected, and a lot of you have multiple devices that are connected to the internet at the same time. And then Google's got like millions of machines in their data centers. I mean, there's just a gazillion machines that are online. So what are we doing to address this? Well, there's a new version of the internet protocol, IPv6. This is starting to be rolled out. Has anyone seen an address like this before? Yeah, these are, yeah, these are starting to, to, to kind of uh, invade our consciousness. Um, I suspect that these are probably more unfamiliar to you. So this is what's called an IPv6 address. All I'm going to say about IPv6 is that it fixes the problem with IPv4. IPv6, there are now 128 bits in the address. That means, I think if I remember correctly, if I wanted to, Every atom in the universe could have an IP address. And I think we'd still have some left over. That's probably enough, right? But who knows? Maybe we'll need more. Um, but yeah, this is a much larger address space designed to address these problems, right? So the second thing that IP dictates, so the first thing is addressing. When you bring a computer online, you receive an address. That is what identifies you on the internet and distinguishes your computer from the 3.999 billion other computers that are connected. The other thing that IP um, uh, determines is how messages are structured. So when you send data to another computer, how does a computer represent data? This is good review, going all the way back to the beginning of the semester. Remember, everything a computer touches has to be represented as what? Whether it's an image, a text message, yeah. A number, yeah, numbers. Or sequences of numbers an array of numbers, everything the computer works with. If you think it's a string, it's not really a string because internally it's a series of numbers. If you think it's a picture, it's not really a, a picture internally, it's a series of numbers. Everything is a series of numbers. And so when I send you a bunch of numbers on the internet, I send you an array of ints, essentially. Your computer has to figure out what on earth is in there. Like, what is the structure of this message? So here it is. So this, again, IP is a real thing. This is part of the internet protocol agreement. Every message that you transmit over the internet has this format. This is how we've agreed to get this to work. I'm not going to talk about this much. Um, you guys, if you go on and take courses in computer networking, you'll see this again. This is, um, there's all, so th these are the bits, right? So essentially this is the first 32 bits of the message, the second 32 bits of the message, the third 32 bits of the message, one thing you'll see here, this is important, every message sent on the internet contains two addresses. One is the destination. Where am I sending the message to? The other is the source. Where did it come from? So it's not that different than an envelope that you might address if you were sending something through the mail. The recipient's address and then a return address. So I've got the source address, this is where the message came from, 
and the destination. Then down here, I have data. That's why I get to send you arbitrary information. So the first, um, let's see here, the first 20 bytes of the message are structured by the IP protocol. Every single packet being sent around the internet has this information in it, all of them. Whether it's web traffic, whether it's streaming music, whether it's Google moving data back and forth between their data centers, whether it's you know, encrypted communications, you know, whatever. They all have this structure to the first 20 bytes. So the first 20 slots in your array of integers have this structure. Past that, who knows? Past that, it's up to, past that, things get more specific to what exactly we're doing. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so I, I wanna, you know, and, and, and these, uh, the, the people that, were, that helped birth this system, I think, don't get, an, don't get enough credit, right? I mean, you guys have all heard the name Mark Zuckerberg, right? You've all heard the name Bill Gates. You've all heard about Sergey Brin, and you've heard about, you know, some of these people that have built these famous internet service companies. But how many people have heard the name Vint Cerf before right now? Yeah, so um, the people that, you know, the people that built this system, and this is a really cool story, right? So this is, you know, back in the 50s, there a bunch of graduate students at various institutions that were starting to, to mess around with this equipment. And to some degree, actually I would say to a great degree, we owe everything that has happened since then to some of the decisions that they made. Um, you know, I think if one of the, you know, there, there are now people that talk about, well, let's change the architecture of the internet. I think if you design the internet a hundred times, you would only get an internet this good once or twice. It's just an incredible accident of history that we ended up with something that has produced and has supported so much innovation. One of the fun parts of the story is that, so, you know, I've got like a minute left, so let me tell the really quick version of it. There's a bunch of graduate students that are messing around with this equipment, um, and Essentially, they're starting to come up with agreements about how things work. But the whole time, they're wondering, like, wait, isn't someone in charge? Like, an adult at some point is going to show up, like, in a suit and tell us, oh, well, here's how it works, right? So they, they, there's this joke that they kept saying, you know, when are the adults going to show up? When is the person from the Department of Defense or from the NSF? Or when is, and, and the truth was, there, no one knew what was going on. No one knew what to do. And so what happened is these incredibly passionate, very intelligent, um, very forward-thinking students got to design this system that eventually has served to undergird everything, almost everything that goes on in the world of technology. So again, this could be you, seriously, you know, going forward. It's possible that in your lifetime, in your journey through technology, you will be at a point like this, and if you find yourself in that place, all that I can hope for you is that you will end up making decisions as good as they did. All right, uh, my office hours today are canceled. I've gotta go home. Um, good luck finishing up MP4. Just so you're not alarmed, there's no homework problem on Monday. There will be a homework problem on Tuesday, and then we'll continue at that point. Have a great weekend, I'll see you guys on Monday.